so welcome to uh, the promised Auntie Mary Cat story time. Uh, we'll see how this works. Today I'm going to read The Devil's Hope from West Wind's Pool, which is a story set in the Devil's West and features a character named uh, Graciendo who appears in the novels. But it takes place um, long before the novels happen. There were seven crows waiting in the apple tree when Old Bear awoke. They watched him, beady eyes blinking, but did not utter a single caw as he stumbled out of the cabin, rubbing at his face and stretching sleep-tight muscles into wakefulness. Their silence was worse than their commentary. He felt the prickling of their regard between his shoulder blades. He had slept poorly and woken too early, and was in no mood for whatever mischief they had in mind. The creek still had ice on its surface, a thin crackling underneath which fat-sided silvers turned and turned, chasing tidbits as the waters drew them past. He broke the crackling, the weight of his shadow across the water making the silver fish turn again and scatter. He cupped sharp cold water in leathery palms, drawing it up to soften his sleep-parched throat. It was no replacement for another week or two of sleep, but there was no help for it. The winds had woken him, swirling about the rooftop and shoving cold fingers down the chimney, and if they were disturbed, then he must be as well. Considering the creek, he knelt, knees in the mud, and shoved his head underneath the water, feeling the bright coldness sting his skin. He pulled back, gasping, water dripping from face and hair, and shuddered. Across the creek, a wary doe watched him, her belly thick with life. Get on with you, he told her, his voice scratchy with disuse. There's nothing to worry about. But even as she picked her way through the tall grasses, he wondered if he'd lied. One of the crows, more daring and more foolish than their siblings, spoke when he returned to the cabin. He is coming. Old Bear glanced up into the tree, trying to track which one had spoken. Six of the crows fluttered their wings nervously, but the seventh stared back. He is coming. What will you do? Old Bear growled, running thick fingers through the hair that clung to his scalp and neck, sending a fine spray of water into the sparse grass at his feet. What do you care? The crow shrugged, which was no answer. Old Bear growled again, rubbing a damp palm against the flat of his face before stomping back into the cabin. He had woken, and now he was hungry. There were beans in the pantry and dried corn still on the cob, and the lingering coals from the fire he had banked before pulling the blanket over his ears and going to sleep. It would have to do. The crow followed him in through the single window, the tanned leather drawn tight and latched no match for its clever beak, while its kin shifted and hopped on the branch outside. I will, it didn't speak now, but watched him, needy black eyes and blinking. I will do nothing, Old Bear said finally, not until he comes. The crow tilted its head. And then, Old Bear grumbled to himself and said, and then I will feed him crow brother stew. Each morning for the three days following, Old Bear stood outside his cabin and waited, patient with the knowledge that there was nothing to do but wait. On the morning of the third day, he arrived, leading a raw boned mule up the path, both of them sure-footed and sparse as goats. The silver shone on his lapel, proud and pure, and Old Bear snorted even as he came to the door and waited, arms crossed over his bare chest, thumbs tucked into the curves of his elbows. The man stopped a polite distance away, his gaze taking in every detail of the cabin and the trees. Graciendo, Marshal. The man let a flicker of a smile touch his face before becoming stern again. You knew why I was coming. Did I? He felt honest curiosity at the idea that he had known anything, that this man might know what he knew. They might have done anything ever to make a human come to his door, much less a human bearing the sigil of the territory, branch and root within the endless circle. Perhaps he was still sleep dulled. Perhaps more had passed him by than he knew. The marshal pursed his lips, eyes dark as old bear's own, watching him from under the brim of his hat. Are we truly going to play this game? In the branches overhead, the crowds coughed their mockery, and old bear sighed. Come inside, then. Marshals were a new thing for old bear, but there had always been people on his mountain, for as long as he could remember living there. For the most part, he ignored them, and they returned the favor. Occasionally, there would be a feckless cub seeking to prove his idiocy by venturing near to steal a clump of fur or a discarded shirt and return to his fellows with proof. 
Depending on the season and his mood, Old Bear might allow him close or chase him off with a roar. Old Bear is not tame, the new hut elders warned their cubs to no avail. If anything, it made them worse. But such was the nature of cubs, and Old Bear did not take offense. There were others who made the climb as well, elders in ceremonial gear bearing offerings of dried fish and bread, sweet-smelling woods and carvings in his vague likeness. They left their offerings a distance from his cabin, retreating and waiting before making their requests, respectful without fear. He enjoyed speaking with them, slow, thoughtful conversations that often left him with more to chew on than the smoked fish or dried berry leathers. Through them, he learned what went on beyond the mountains in the long spread of earth that ran down to the waters. It had not been too many seasons past when Braid's feet had placed a wooden platter on a rock and waited until he had eaten his fill before speaking for the first time of white men at the banks of the grandmother and the being that rose up to bar their way. Old Bear had thought at first he had misheard and then that Braid's feet had listened too long to the moonfish and lost his way in their waters. Who did what? Was I somehow unclear? Braid's feet was nearly as ancient as then as Old Bear and felt no need for polite words between them. I will speak again, more slowly. A spirit has raised itself to stand on the grandmother waters, claiming mastery of the lands from he there to here. He had not misheard, and there was no madness in Braid's feet's eyes that Old Bear could discern. A spirit. Spirits might meddle in the lives of those around them for sport or purpose, but they did not take responsibility. They did not claim anything, much less the earth itself. Master of the lands and those who live within them? Braid's feet inclined his head, metal gray braid falling over one bare bronze shoulder. And you agreed to this? Braid's feet tilted his head back, gray tufted eyebrows rising like an owl's. It did not ask any more than any powers ask. Old Bear had to acknowledge the truth of that. Still, the arrogance claiming the earth itself? He was not certain if what he felt was astonishment at the arrogance or amusement, perhaps both. But a claim of such needed power to hold it, either of winds or bone. A touch of the bones beneath his feet returned nothing but a contented humming of sleepy winter turning slowly to growing spring. If this spirit had disturbed the earth with its claims, it was not yet apparent. Nor was there a sense of anything new within its bounds and the winds remained silent, almost as though they too were waiting. That was not a good omen. And what is it they seek to do with this mastery? For now, nothing. Shouting across the waters at men on the other side in the language of the southern horse folk until they left without crossing and giving headaches to the medicine carriers who live nearby. Their words to the people were gentler, but no less stern. If any man of white face is to cross the river, give him leave to pass so long as he offers no insult and gives fair trade for land he uses. And this being claims the right to enforce this? It does. They seem to be young yet, Old Bear said, a curl to his lip that, lips that had little to do with humor. They may yet regret, regret taking such a bite when it comes time to chew. Braid's feet went away after that, and other elders came. Other cubs come to count coup on Old Bear to prove their foolish bravery. And the seasons passed as they always had, Old Bear giving no more thought to the story Braid's feet had told, for what happened far away along the edge of the grandmother waters had little to do with him and his. Until those who crossed grandmother made their way farther west, bypassing the fertile plains and game heavy forests to climb into the jagged fingers and rock and pine where Old Bear made his home. The first sounds had reached him on a crisp autumn morning, the crack and whistle bringing nothing good. He'd slam the cabin door shut behind him, branches crunching under his heavy tread, the rumbling growl coming from his chest carrying forward through the thick trunk trees. By the time he emerged into the new felled clearing, his claws had emerged, pushing through fingertips and boot leather as easily as plants punch through leaf and loam. He'd known what he would see, but that made the sight no less infuriating. Voices exploded when he left the shadows of the tree line, shouting at him, around him, rising in pitch even as they raised their weapons, axe and pick and a single long-nosed musket. He raised his growl to a roar that cut through their noise and cut them down as easily as they'd the, hewn the trees around them, leaving a stunned silence. The men in front of him, filthy, clad in clothing that needed burning far more than the wood they had gathered, hair stringy, skin grubbed pale under beards that rivaled his own, gaped in astonishment. Then one of them twisted as though to reach for an axe leant against a pile of rocks. Old Bear growled again and the man froze. Not the people, 
and not the usual Spaniards or even hunter-men down from Rupert's Glen tracking game, or they would have known better, with better manners. Five men in his sight, but he smelled more, the stink of urine and burnt meat, iron and alcohol. His nose wrinkled. The cubs occasionally stink of that as well, and it made them clumsy and loud. You need to leave, he told them in Spanish. They glanced at each other, then one of them lifted his chin, face shifting from terror to stubborn determination. What are you to tell us what to do? His Spanish was terrible, but comprehensible. Old Bear snapped at the air and gave the man credit for courage as well as foolishness when he did not flinch or run. We were told to dig here, the man said, his chin no less jutted for all that he still stank of fear. By who? The others took a half step back in reaction to his growl, and his ears flipped once, and he rolled his eyes and lifted his paws, pulling the claws in as they watched. I'm not going to eat you. They all looked to be sinew and bone even beyond the stink. He'd rather eat brambles and dirt. We made agreement, one of the other men said, his voice shaking. Agreement! Agreement. These humans kept bleeding about agreement as though agreement had anything to do with him. His gaze moved past them to the rough camp they'd thrown down overnight, grudgingly acknowledging that the shelter looked well enough built, the fire pit rock-rimmed and cleaned of debris away from overhanging branches. He could not fault them there, though his beard twitched and the need to find something to vent his ire on. This place is not for you, he said in a low grumble, aware that they'd offered no insult save foolishness, were no threat to anyone save themselves. Get thee gone. Unlike previous intruders, these did not flee at his command, but stood their ground, if nervously. We have the right to be here. And then the speaker paused, one of the men behind him speaking rapidly in their language, a babel of meaningless sounds. Oh, the first speaker swallowed, blinked, the scent of him changing from fear to stubbornness to, old bear sniffed the air embarrassment? We, are you the keeper of this dirt? We have gifts to give. That is right, yes? No gifts, no camp, no you. His grasp on words was slipping, his face elongating again in his irritation, and he smelled sharper, fresher urine as one of those before him lost control of his functions. We were told, the speaker began again, his hand stretching as though to push Old Bear back, and his temper stretched too far, broke. There was an unpleasant crunch of something in his teeth, the grit of, taste of grit in his throat, and he hoped that he hadn't bitten anything fatal. Rolling over, Old Bear felt the sun on his face and the prickle of needle leaf cushioning his back. He had not made it back to the cabin, taking refuge in a deep overhang. Looking around his teeth thoughtfully, he breathed in and out, feeling the faint hum of the earth below him, the bones of the world deep under the stone, pulsing in time to the rise and fall of his heart. He remembered, vaguely now, the snap of teeth and the swipe of claw as he'd broken the white man's camp, scattering stick and stone, dropping to all fours to prowl the outskirts, peeing on the marks of their presence, scattering the stones of their fire pit until it appeared they had come and gone long ago. Once they'd fled, he had no quarrel with them. With luck and common sense, they would flee far and warn others that this mountain was not for settling on. But luck and common sense seemed in small supply among these folk. Not a month later, when the streams were full-throated with snowmelt, he heard the sound of axes and shot bolts once again. Old Bear. This time the intruder stepped forward when he emerged from into the clearing, rather than shying away. His new hall was not perfect, but fluent enough to be understood, and his hand moved in the trade sign Old Bear had taught them generations ago. We come with the consent of the Nuha elders and the devil's advice, to bring silver from the deep that others may bend it to use. We have no desire to disrupt your peace and offer no insult to your ancient self. Whatever, give, whatever gifts you require for our presence, we will do our best to offer. The old the man spoke with the diffident straightforwardness of truth, and Old Bear found himself unwillingly paused. He felt the urge to tear them out of the clearing, to erase them from the land. But they had spoken fairly, without fear. Who would give them that much respect? I do not know this devil you speak of, and I desire no gifts. You have nothing I need, nothing I wish for. He wanted quiet and solitude, and they could give him that only by going away. And yet, if they spoke true and he thought they did, the new had given them leave to be here. This was something new. What games did the cubs play at now? There were eleven of them this time, well-formed men with the weight of hard work on their shoulders and hips. Their clothing rough and dirtied, but they carried themselves well, unlike thieves skulking in the night and he sank to his haunches and waited for the leader to do the same opposite him. You plan to dig the earth, scrape at the silver? Yes, 
The man looked puzzled, as though there was no reason to question their, ask their actions. Old Bear resisted the urge to growl. He supposed he could, if he wished, understand the elders' thinking. Nuggets of pure silver were valued for their ability to warn of danger, to clear the paths and ease dreaming, and the mountains were stingy with what they let slip into the streams. Allowing these fools to disturb the mountains while taking the benefit of their work, cunning to use the agreement in their favor. But no, he would be no part of this. If the Nuah had forgotten what would happen, he had not. You will die here if you dig too deep. This land is not tame, no more than he was, and it will not give up itself to you so easily. We know the risks and the rewards. He used the wrong word, but Old Bear knew men well enough to hear what he meant. And he'd listen now to what the agreement required of the whites who crossed the grandmother and who sought a place here. His words were a grumbling growl, filled with intent. I do not consent. The old man, the man shifted for a moment looking uncomfortable, but his chin was set and his eyes were hard. The elders say you place no claim on this land. Your consent is not needed. We will do this. Old Bear looked down at his hands where the claws had quietly pushed through the skin. We will not. There had been more men seeking to dig the bones, and he had sent them away. But now a marshal sat by his fire, his long legs stretched before him, the dusty dullness of his boot leather a reminder that the road now led to Old Bear's door, and the marshal had protections against even such as he. Graciendo. The Spanish had named him that. It did not bother him particularly. He had many names, and they all meant the same thing. We can't keep doing this. Old Bear looked at the marshal and did not speak. He could, and he would. All they needed to do was stop it, to stop him was stop sending fools here to die. The fire cracked and popped, and the birds finished their, do, their dusk song, falling silent before the time of night hunters. Something dropped onto the roof, a low, hollow sound, and then there was silence. The marshal rubbed his hands over his face, then exhaled through his fingers. Graciendo, you are ancient, and no one gets to be ancient with also losing their foolishness. The territory needs the silver the mountains hold. The mountains hold it for us. Parceled out bit by bit, carried in streams and rivers, not far, but far enough, and picked up and carried further in belts and knives, braids and boots, around necks and wrists and ceremonial gear of societies. That worked when there were fewer of us. Better now that we control it, maintain it, than fools rush in and take it without understanding. Fools always rush, and end badly. He could still remember the taste of gristle and grit in his teeth, the feel of solid flesh under his paw, and wrinkled his lips at the memory. But he had given fair warning. The insult was not his. Better to not let them near at all. Let them die somewhere else. Let them do damage elsewhere, far away from his home. My parents were fools once, too, the marshal said, his tone mild once again. They crossed the mud water, looking for something they couldn't name, couldn't explain. It found them, taught them, kept them alive until they understood it. The marshal's skin was pale, but he wore his hair like a warrior and carried the sigil on his breast, the silver at his heart. He knew what he asked of Old Bear, knew what he asked of the mountain. These fools do not understand what they dig for. The blood of the bones was dangerous. Washed by the rivers, it calmed, taken from the birthstone, it shared a certain madness with the winds. Then teach them. That's what the devil's sending them for. Old Bear blinked at the man for the first time feeling a touch of surprise. Street River, Jordan, you didn't... <sighs> the marshal lifted his chin, staring at the ceiling as though asking the winds for patience. Old Bear could have told them the winds did not know the meaning of the word, and even if they did, the price they would demand for it would be far too high. You thought I'd teach them? We didn't think you'd eat them. More fool you then, Old Bear grumbled, feeling the skin under his whiskers flush. And more fool your devil, thinking to send fools to dig the bones. Young or not, they should know better. There was a flash of something in the marshal's eyes, a glint of sunlight despite the roof over their heads or the reflection of the fire, or something carried deep within, and then it was gone. There's no choice. The marshal's voice was deeper, darker than breath before, and old bear's head jerked up, eyes narrowing, nostrils flaring as though to catch the scent of something new entered into his home. But it was only them. Even the crows had left off eavesdropping and settled into their roosts for the night. More men will come, the marshal went on. The devil can only keep them out for so long, can only filter their greed so fine. They crowd the shores, push their way in, spread and increase. It will happen. It is happening. The mud water is not enough alone to keep them out. 
The devil himself is not enough, not forever. They will come and they will be too many to eat. The agreement buys time, offers the chance to make them ours rather than the other way around. But we need to use that time. Old Bear grumbled deep in his chest, fingers raking hair off his forehead, lingering at the back of his neck where a knot was beginning to form. He didn't like talking, didn't like thinking. He just wanted to be left alone. And bothering the bones? How does that better things? The look the marshal gave him suggested the man thought Old Bear was playing the fool. Silver is power. More, silver is protection. You think I... I think you see only what you want to see, what is comfortable for you to see. The marshal was still seated, still slumped in his chair, but there was a tension in his body Old Bear did not mistake. The sigil on his chest glinted in the firelight. The river and the devil will not hold them forever, the marshal repeated, and you know what will happen then. There was a stillness, even the fire pausing in its crackle, the settling of something thick and heavy in the air, sucking itself into Old Bear's lungs. Deep in the bones, silver did not merely glint in stillness the way the sigil did. It flowed, living and dangerous to pull it unwilling into the air. Graciendo, for what is still human in you, help us. The marshal left in the dawn, his mule trailing behind, strands of grass still hanging from its mouth as it chewed. What will you do? One of the crows asked, perching sideways on a branch, peering cock-headed at the figure below. Old bear let his face slip through, lips pulling back from teeth, snout wrinkling, with ears flattening against his head, but the crow did not flinch nor fly off, waiting, attentive, for news to spread. The devil's hope is doomed, Old Bear said. I'll have no part of it. He sighed, letting his face slip away, features smoothing back to the sod. But I won't eat them anymore. If they've a hope, these humans, they will have the chance to earn it.